Josh. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And first, I want to congratulate Doug for initiating this and this this uh, effort, uh, this symposium, forum, think tank. It's very important that we have these types of groups, and especially groups led by people like Doug, who understand the issue and the problem and the concern, so that those of us who are in, in public policy have resources we can go to to get information, and also forums that we can participate in like this, where we can communicate effectively and get feedback, which will hopefully be helpful to policymakers. So it is critical, and I congratulate you for pursuing this effort. Uh, Doug asked me to speak today a little bit about what I see the comparatives between the United States situation and the European situation. Uh, unfortunately, the com comparisons are fairly stark and fairly significant and regrettably si dramatically overlapping in their identity of problems. Uh, we, the United States, Europe and Japan face essentially the same issue, which is that we have just spent a heck of a lot of money we don't have, and we continue to spend it. And we're passing on to our kids a deficit and a debt situation which is unsustainable. Everybody seems to agree on that. And this is all compounded by a rising demographic shift in the populations of Western Europe, the United States, and has already occurred in Japan, and is going to get worse in Japan. So we're moving into waters which are going to be, to speak kindly, very stormy for us economically and very difficult for us. Wanted to show you first, uh, let's see, can I get this to work here? There we go. My, one of my favorite quotes. You go back, Adam Smith got it right, you know, 300 years ago. You know, he said, great nations are never impoverished by private though they sometimes are through public prodigality and misconduct. I had to look up prodigality, but basic, basically, back in the 17th century, or the 18th century when he wrote this, it meant government spent a lot of money they don't have and wasted money. So he understood the concept then. We should understand it now because it's been, it's human nature and it's our problem. I want to skip this chart and come back to it because it's a very important chart, but I want to go to this chart first. This puts us in a comparative situation relative to sovereign debt problem for the United States and other Western European countries and Japan. There is a rule of thumb, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is that when your sovereign debt, your public sovereign debt exceeds 60% of GDP and your total debt exceeds 90% of GDP, 80%, probably even 70% of GDP, uh, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And if you look at this chart, you'll see that <clears throat> Japan is in serious trouble. The one advantage they have is that they're big enough, strong enough, and have a savings mentality as a population that they can internally finance a lot of their debt so they don't have to go and borrow it from other countries. But the next three countries and four countries in a row here, Iceland's already gone through the crisis. Greece is in the crisis. Italy's on the cusp of the crisis. Ireland is in the crisis. Belgium, and then us. The advantage we have over everybody else who's in front of us, other than Japan, is that we can monetize our own debt because we control our currency. Those other four countries have currency issues which they don't control. But this, this uh, chart makes it pretty starkly clear that we're already in unsustainable situation relative to debt. The leverage problem is massive. Europe having the worst problem as a country, as a region, a leverage, of course, being a debt issue. Uh, the financial needs uh, are huge because all of this debt has to be refinanced. If you can't roll over your debt, you go into insolvency, bankruptcy. Uh, basically, you default, and you can see that the rollover situation is massive uh, relative to the amount of debt that's maturing. Interesting, this is an interesting chart just for the, because I find it fascinating as to where these basically countries have invested that have gotten them into so much trouble that have created their sovereign debt. And a lot of this is an Eastern European problem for Europe. For us it's just a problem that we spend a heck of a lot of money we don't have and we continue to do that. 
Okay, this is the baseline of the United States debt situation, and this is, this is the line that is basically our problem. Historically, our debt in this country has been about 35% of GDP. This is public debt. This isn't uh, all our debt total. Uh, if you talk to Kent Conrad, he'll talk total debt because the number is more stark. But actually, I think public debt is a, is a, more, is a more genuine number. Um, as you can see, we've been held in that 35% line for a long, long time. Uh, and you have a very strong and robust nation when your debt is 35% of your GDP. But as your debt moves up, that becomes a serious problem. And in fact, interestingly enough, the European Economic Unit has rules. And the rules are, if your deficits exceed 3% of GDP and your debt exceeds 60% of GDP, you, you're not supposed to be able to get entry into it. And you're in violation of its basic principles if you're already in it. So you can see that we not only, uh, we couldn't get into the European Union assuming we wanted to right now, which we don't obviously, but as a very practical matter, that's a group of industrial states that have made a fairly reasonable assumption as to what is fiscally responsible for countries to do in their management of their debt and deficit situation. Uh, we are in an irresponsible area and it's going straight up. It's going straight up. This number here, if we, if we extended this line out to 2030, 2040, it goes straight up. It crosses 100%. Public debt, incredible. Public debt crossed 100%. Total debt already has crossed 100%. We're doubling our debt in five years, tripling it in 10 years. You've seen these numbers before. This is a function of the fact that the budget that was proposed by the president averages 5.5% deficits over the next 10 years, a trillion dollars plus a year on average. Uh, and that leads to a doubling of the debt in five years and a tripling in 10 years. Driven in large part by Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, the three major entitlement programs, which historically we've spent about 20% of GDP on government in this country. Uh, these three programs alone will take up 20% of GDP by the mid of the next of the, of the third decade of this of this century. How do I get that? Okay. Oops. The total debt in the outstanding accounts of those, those three accounts is $77 trillion. That's the unfunded liability that exists already between Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. $77 trillion. That's a number that I can't put into perspective because I don't know what $77 trillion is. But to try to put it in perspective, compare it to all the taxes paid in the United States since 1789 when we started collecting taxes as a nation, as a federal government, that's $48 trillion. Take the entire net worth of this country, all our cars, all our stock, all our houses, everything. That's $54 trillion. We have an unfunded liability in those three accounts that exceeds by 50%, essentially, our entire net worth as a country. What does that mean? That is definitionally bankruptcy. That's exactly what it means. That's a bankrupt operation when you have a debt that exceeds your net worth by that much. I want to go back here before we go to that slide, if I can, to this slide that I find fascinating. Heritage uh, did this slide. They put public debt on one axis, this one over here, and then they put their rating of democratic liberalism, basically how free market is a country, how free is a country, on the other axis. And if you notice, what I call the state market economies all have the lowest debt, whereas the public, whereas the democratic market economies have the worst debt situation. Well, that's, that's an interesting factor. What causes that? Elections. That's what causes that. And so we get to this fact here, which is the most undeniable and significant fact which we confront as a government and which we have to deal with. All of our entitlement programs that are of significance, Medicare, Social Security specifically, were designed on the pyramid concept of financing, where you have a lot of people paying in for a few people taking out. The theory was in 1950 you had 16 people paying in for every one person taken out of Social Security. 
So you could support fairly robust benefit structures and an aggressive program. Because you had all these people paying in. You had a younger population. In 2010, we moved from 16 and a half people paying in to one person taking out to two people paying in for one person taking out. You go from a pyramid to a rectangle. These two people are our kids in the future. They can't afford to support me on full retirement on Medicare, under our present Medicare structure or our present Social Security structure, and yet that's what they're being asked to do, and that's why the numbers don't work. This is not a unique problem for us. It's a problem for all the Western European countries, but especially for Japan, the United States, and the UK, all of which have these massive aging populations. This re leads me to a simple conclusion, that when you have an elective government, a populist government, which is what we have in this country. We have an extraordinarily populist government right now, a panderingly populist government, if you're going to be honest about it right now. Uh, and that populist government meets a massive demographic shift, which is what's occurring right now. In an entitlement society, it produces unsustainable debt. And that's what we confront. That's the substantive problem that we confront today. You know, the issue is interesting because <clears throat> if you look at the 19th century and you look at the 20th century, and then at the beginning of the 19th century, Bismarck said that the defining, at the beginning of the 20th century, Bismarck said that the defining factor of the 19th century was that the United States and England spoke the same language. And if you look at the 20th century, the defining event was that democracy and capitalism defeated totalitarianism and managed state economies. The question is, 10 years into this decade, into this century, can the English-speaking theory of government, which has been adopted by Western civilization and by Japan, the theories of, of Hobbes, not Hobbes, <laughs> of Hutchinson, Locke, and Adam Smith, basically the Scottish Enlightenment movement, can those theories of a democratically driven government and a market-oriented society that functions off that government, can it compete, can we compete in the 21st century against these state-run economies that are market, these state governments that are market economies? Because of this fact, which is that we are voting ourselves into unsustainable debt. And we have already voted ourselves into unsustainable debt. I don't know the answer to that question, except that I genuinely believe the inherent resilience of America uh, will lead the rest of the Western nations that have committed themselves to a democratic approach out of this problem. But to do that, we've got to start making some very tough decisions. We have to start telling it like it is. We can't keep lying to ourselves or to the American people about where we are and where we're headed. We can't every week pass in the Congress a bill that adds more to the deficit and debt in the name of some social justice initiative because it's momentarily good. We can't keep in place a benefit structure in Medicare and in Social Security which is unsustainable for our children's future and we can't have a tax law which essentially is destructive of capital formation, which is where we're headed over the next few months as we see the tax laws readjust. So we're going to have to step up to the plate here and make some very difficult decisions. I would suggest four areas where those decisions are doable. I mean, they've got, they got to be doable, politically doable. The first would be energy. Let's stop sending $300 billion to people who hate us and start producing more American energy and shifting to resources in the United States and also forcing us to use more energy efficient uh, vehicles, especially hybrid cars, and obviously promote conservation and alternative sources. But recognize that American produced energy, nuclear, gas, is critical to our future and force ourselves into that. Secondly. We can correct Social Security tomorrow. We can correct it today if we had the political will. 
What a strong statement it would be to the international markets and to Americans if we were to make Social Security solvent for the next 50 years. And we can do it without any draconian event occurring. It won't be, it would hardly be a noticed event for people who are on Social Security and for people coming on to Social Security. Because there are only four or five moving parts. And they can be adjusted over time. You don't have to do this tomorrow. You can phase it in over 10 years, 15 years, as long as you have in place a clear glide path to solvency on the Social Security system. Thirdly, we've got to re recognize that the, that the health care bill that was just passed is a disaster for us as a nation. We cannot afford a $1.5 trillion expansion in the size of this government. We cannot afford to take the government up, as the President is proposing, under his plan, to unsustainable levels of 27, 28 percent of GDP. Because we can't catch our tail. Because our revenues are not able to accomplish that. This chart is the most devastating chart that I know of. I mean, it's just, just you look at this chart and you say to yourself, how do we fix it? Because even under the President's own assumptions, taxes, which have been 18 percent of GDP historically, exceed that percentage up to almost hit what is the historical spending levels of government, which is 20 percent. That's this is the president's numbers. He's presuming that our tax revenues are actually going to reach what has been our historical level of spending, and yet he's taking spending right through the roof. He genuinely believes that if you expand government, you create prosperity. I mean, he's very open about this, as is this government that we're functioning under today. But inevitably, this gap here is created by that. And it's not closed. It's not closed unless we make a tough decision on how we're going to finance health care around here. And that means you don't cut Medicare by a trillion dollars, which is what the President's plan did, cut it by a trillion dollars when fully implemented over a 10-year period, two trillion dollars over 30, the first, uh, three trillion, was it three trillion over the first 20 years? Two, two, th two trillion over the first 20 years, and take that money and create a new entitlement with it. If you're going to make those types of very tough calls on Medicare, which this bill actually did, you use that money to reduce the debt so that Medicare is more solvent. You don't create new entitlements with it. That's the third thing you have to do. And fourth, you have to change the tax laws. Senator Wyden and I have come forward with a proposal which basically makes it a much, makes the tax laws much simpler, much more logical, fewer brackets. At the same time, it broadens the base, it keeps progressivity, and gives a huge impetus to capital formation by cutting the capital gain, by ca cutting the corporate rate from 35% to 24%. We cannot allow us to have a tax law, which is basically a massive avoidance and is a disincentive for capital formation and economic activity, which is what we have today. So those four things need to be done. And fifth, and most important, we have to have a government which appreciates that the engine of economic growth, vitality, and revenue for the government is the individual entrepreneur in this nation. We cannot go down this path of trying to turn the American government into a Western social democratic style government, which is what, where we're headed under this present uh, administration and this present Congress. Because that is a recipe for anemic growth and for disincentivizing the productive sector and especially the individual from going out and taking a risk. But if we did those five things, if we got our energy policies right, got Social Security right, did some substantive things in the area of health care delivery services, and especially in the area of Medicare, address the tax laws in a constructive way, and reinvigorated individuals by not suffocating them with a government that wants to move, this, move into a Western-style European democracy. I believe that these problems, which are so acute, would be significantly resolved and the natural resilience of this nation would take care of the rest. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions.